I am here in the heart of Morocco. This bird on my wrist is a peregrine falcon. It is the fastest animal in the world, reaching speeds of up to 400 kilometers an hour when it swoops. So my new friend is faster than a Formula One car. Imagine how it feels to carry this bird on my arm, this perfect machine that has been tamed by local falconers. Finding it was quite an adventure. My journey started in Agadir, a new town and gateway to the south. I am in Agadir. This city had to be rebuilt following a massive earthquake in 1960, measuring 5.9 on the Richter scale and claiming 12,000 lives. It's insane. How are you? Fine. And you? Agadir is the place to be in Morocco. Everyone comes here. Agadir is Morocco's seventh city in terms of population, but it is one of the top tourist destinations, along with Marrakesh, the first animal I've seen. Only one hump, so it's a dromedary. And we're by the sea, so there are gulls. As always, I'm searching for animals, even in the city. Judging by the crowds, all the action is by the sea. You're a well-fed mongrel. Arabic. I'm on a trip to learn about the animals of Morocco. Welcome. Typical. Here's the beach, and I'm off to the desert. Never mind, at least I've had a dip. Where is the port? Over there. Bye. Here, kitty. The flock of seagulls at Agadir Port reminds me of why I'm here, for the falcons. Morocco is home to the last tribe of falconers in North Africa, the Quassums. En route to meet them, I plan to check out all the wild and domesticated species that Morocco has to offer. Falcons, do you see falcons here? They're rare. They're rare? People have suggested I visit the zoo. The earthquake destroyed the Medina here, so local families spend their Sundays in this park, which they call Bird Valley. It is home to animals from Morocco and the rest of Africa. This is amazing. I'm at a zoo in the city centre and it's free. There are Barbary sheep here. Agadir Zoo is the only place I'll see them. They're sturdy creatures. Is that the souk? It's the biggest souk in Africa. The biggest souk in Africa? Are you sure? Yes. Come on, I found a guide. Ginseng, an aphrodisiac? It feels good. What's that? Alum. Ah, alum. Look at that snake skin. That's a python. This is the land of snake hunters. In Africa, they hunt pythons for their skins. It's terrible. Camphor and menthol? Just a tiny bit. Amazing. It's like pure peppermint. It's good for your throat. As I wander through the souk, I have one thought running through my mind. It is traditional in North Africa to use animal skins, tortoise shells, gazelle horns, birds' feathers, sometimes even hyenas' brains for aphrodisiac purposes, or to ward off evil spirits, or even just as a remedy. And here I found an elderly gentleman who is selling the skins of hedgehogs, leopards, and snakes. There is obviously some animal trafficking going on. He won't let me visit his stall. He just keeps saying, no pictures. Animal trafficking is just as widespread in the world as arms dealing and drugs trafficking, and it's a tragedy for biodiversity. They were probably caught in the wild, which isn't great. And this is a goldfinch. This makes me sad, because I love watching goldfinches in my garden. The best goldfinches fetch a high price.
I must find my contact to see if he has any news on my search. Brahim? Hello. How's it going? Good, thanks, Remy. Everything okay? Everything's great. You're not getting me up there, are you? <laughs> yes, we're going for a ride. Do you have any news on the falconers we talked about? The biggest concentration of falconers is in the Dukala region. I'm going to take a trip into the wild to explore the parts of Morocco I'm not familiar with. Right. And I'll make sure my path leads me there. It's in central Morocco, just to the north. There's a whole community of falconers there. You'll see. I have a good feeling about this. I've heard that near Agadir, there's a nature reserve for species which can no longer be found in the wild. Do you know it? Of course. It's Sous Massa Park. And what can I see in the Sous Massa Park? Mm. Oryxes. Large desert antelopes. Exactly. And bald ibises. There's a whole menagerie waiting for me there. My wild trip starts tomorrow. That was Agadir. I've been exploring the city today before I head into the wild. This seaside resort is Morocco's second top tourist destination. But that's not what I'm here for. I'm heading east, into the Sahara, and then on to Dukala, a rural region in northern Morocco where a community of falconers live. It's time for me to explore the Moroccan countryside. Sous Massa is a taster of the desert. Nestled in the dunes, this reserve is home to a mythical beast from the Sahara, one that has now disappeared from the wild, the scimitar oryx. Redar is another committed naturalist. I want to share my impressions of Agadir with him and glean some advice. You know, I'm not too sure what to make of Agadir. It's hardly a center for wildlife. I saw very few animals, apart from in the souk, where I saw animal skins and other dubious animal products. Supposedly with magical properties. Uh, take this uh, spiny-tailed lizard, uh, found in the Tata region. It's a reptile, right? Yeah. And it's sold in the souk by poachers on the black market. Now, legend has it that its blood can cure asthma. Well, nonsense. But its throat gets slit anyway. I've heard they even use hyenas. Yeah, the brains. What do they do with them? Sell them as uh, magic charms. So people actually wear them? Right. And they cost a fortune, between 1,000 and 2,000 euros per gram. Last week, on a website, under the heading Animals for Sale, I found a falcon. A falcon? I've come to Morocco to see falcons. I didn't realize you could buy one on the internet. I called the guy. He wanted 300 dirhams for it. I bartered him down to 150. He delivered it to my house, and we released it back into the wild. Right. So you brought a falcon? Yeah. With your own money? Right. And you set it free? It was delivered in a box that size. No way. A small cardboard box. The size of a shoebox. With a tiny hole so it could breathe. That's all. There is a terrible state. When I set it free, I stood back and watched it fly away, and I felt so happy. I can tell from the joy in your voice and the light in your eyes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm going to spread the word on my trip. Right. I don't want to see falcons in cages. I want to see them in the wild, or at least living in harmony with a responsible owner. You'll find a tribe of falconers in the Dukala region. Right. Falconer is in their blood. They love their falcons. Love is a strong word. No, but it's true. You'll see. The falcons there don't live in cages. They, they live in a corner of their master's houses. Really? In the living room? Yeah, yeah. Falcons are revered. That's amazing. Thanks, Redan. Hey, welcome. Redan. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Perhaps the oryxes are behind that hill. I'm going to creep up on them. Amazing. I'm standing beside one of the rarest antelopes in the world, a scimitar oryx. It's beautiful, a work of art. This species of oryx is in real danger of extinction. It's amazing to see one. I'm observing its behavior. 
I'm acting like a predator, so it's a bit anxious. They don't like people creeping up on them and staring at them. Hunted through the ages by Saharan tribes for their meats and their skins, scimitar oryxes with horns of up to 1.5 meters long were even kept as pets in ancient Egypt as a sign of prestige. I hope this oryx will one day leave this reserve and be free to roam the Sahara once again. I'm a real bird lover, so this is paradise for me. This is the only colony left in the world of this iconic species, the bold ibis. It's a wading bird with a long red curved beak and shiny black feathers. And of course, it has no feathers on its head. This beautiful bird is extremely rare and on the verge of extinction. This is its last bastion in the wild, and it's so exciting for me to be standing on the coast of Morocco, above the world's last colony of bold ibises. Incredible. This bodes well for the rest of my trip. It's a fine example of the many endangered species here, which are on the brink of the abyss, literally and figuratively. It's such a tragedy. Next stop, the Sahara, the biggest desert in the world. To get there, we must cross Morocco from west to east. It's a 600 kilometer trip that will take a good 10 hours. There's something there. Perhaps it's a bustard? It is. Amazing. It's the natural prey of the peregrine falcon. I've never seen one before. The bustard is so rare now due to hunting. There's a plan to reintroduce them to Morocco because they're on the verge of extinction. I've arrived in the desert. I must admit, I'm a bit dazed. There's a Bedouin camp. The sand is so fine. Look, if I walk that way, it will take me 42 days to get to Timbuktu. Time to find me a camel. Ahmed, how do you do? Everything is great. Yeah, how are you? Fine, thank you. I'll be honest, it feels a bit strange to arrive in this unfamiliar place. Right. I'm not used to the silence. I heard that in Marrakesh, tourists pay to get their photo taken with snakes. But the snakes keep dying, and so certain species are disappearing from the wild. At this rate, there will be no snakes left in Morocco. Right. They pull out the cobra's fangs. Personally, I'm happy for people to use snakes to make a living, as long as they take care of them. If it's just for show, and they're not fed properly... They don't seem to take care of them. Then, no. How do you see the future of this place? We haven't looked after it. That's a failing. But it's mainly due to a lack of education. In Morocco, lots of species have become extinct. Iroquois Lake, for example, has dried up. There was a lake there? Well, there used to be a lake there, but it hasn't had a drop of water in it since around 1963. So there's no lake there now, which means there are no birds or fish? No, nothing. Just desert? Just desert. Will you make an early start with me tomorrow and show me the landscape? I'd love to. The desert makes you a bit delirious. You lose your bearings. We're in the southeast of Morocco, close to the border with Algeria. 
quite far from Marrakesh. We're southwest of Marrakesh, east of Agadir. Our trek across the desert starts here. This is the final human outpost of the world's biggest desert. My fingers are freezing. That's the paradox of the desert. It's freezing cold at night, especially in winter, and boiling hot in the daytime. And always dry. An area is said to be arid if it gets less than 100 millimeters of rain a year. There are even hyper-arid areas further south which get less than five millimeters. Let's see what this desert has to offer in terms of wildlife. Are you looking for animal footprints too? Yes. What are they? Mice. Mice? Yes, mice. And those are fennecs. Those are fennecs? Yes, and those are beetles. Are Berbers animal lovers? Yes. We are especially close to dromedaries. If we see a dromedary rolling in the sand, well, that means that it's going to rain. The dromedary really is your animal. There's a bird calling to us. The freshwater attracts desert sparrows, the odd, elegant, white-crowned wheat ear, often found on their own, and the more gregarious trumpeter finches with their blood-red beaks. These birds travel far and wide for a drink. This is amazing. A herd of donkeys is approaching the oasis. The only wild donkeys you will see here are feral donkeys. In other words, domestic animals which have returned to the wild. They were neglected, so they came back to the desert. Now they live in wild herds. That young donkey is suckling. It's a unique sight. Goats roam from oasis to oasis, from rock to rock. They seem to enjoy being in the desert, despite the harsh landscape and extreme heat. Here's a Mahari. Careful. It's a type of dromedary. They come from Algeria. They are herbivores and they feed on acacia trees, thanks to their long necks, a bit like giraffes. They are the only large mammals living in the Sahara Desert. That's amazing. This species is becoming increasingly rare in the Sahara. They are Dorcas gazelles, one of the smallest breeds of gazelle, and they are all grey. They have tear pits in the corner of their eyes, stretching down to their snout. The stripes make them look as if they're wearing masks. They're happy in this habitat, but they're in decline. Why? Because of desertification. People rightly think that the desert is expanding, but only because of the soil eroding. Bad farming methods, too much slashing and burning, too much burn beating, too much grazing, overgrazing even, in the case of sheep. The soil dries out and the wind blows the dust away. That just leaves rocks where nothing can grow, so the desert expands, and that poses a real threat to the animals of Morocco. They end up leaving the desert and heading for human habitats, which is no good at all.
Zagora is on the edge of the desert. I am now going to travel from the south to the north of Morocco, crossing the High Atlas to reach the Middle Atlas, where I hope to see the country's last remaining wild monkeys. The key to biodiversity in deserts is oases. This palm grove is vast. It must be 12 kilometers wide. Where there's water, there's life, in the form of wild and domestic animals, such as sheep and donkeys. Where is your house? My house is there. So when you get up in the morning, When people think of deserts, they think of sand dunes. Actually, rocky desert areas, known as ergs or regs, like this one, are more common. It's vast. You could easily get lost. In order to survive in this environment, the plants must put down roots away from the light, even under rocks. When you lift up the rocks, you see things like this. Darkling beetles are experts at adapting to the desert. These tiny bumps on their wing cases capture tiny droplets of water from the ocean mist. The extremes of climate are astonishing. There is snow over there, and I am here in the desert. I'm off to meet Osama, an expert in ecology and biodiversity. He is going to explain the relationship between humans and animals in his country. The way I see it, humans are an integral part of the ecosystem. Right, so they have the same status as all other species? That sentiment is expressed in a verse of the Quran. The animal population. It states that animal species are simply other populations. Sometimes animals benefit from our presence. Yeah, that's true. For example, a donkey which has carried heavy loads for most of its life will be treated as a member of the family and given a burial when it dies. It is cared for when it is sick and everyone is sad when it dies. Right. And if we ask ourselves whether humans can survive without animals, the answer is obvious. We can't. But as to the question of whether animals can survive without humans, the answer is yes, they can survive perfectly well without us. I'm going to Dukala in search of falconers. I was wondering if you knew any more about the relationship between humans and these birds of prey. Apparently, they get along so well that you can go hunting together. Oh, I think the relationship is one-sided, in favour of humans. I'll reserve judgment until I meet the falconers. But it's interesting to hear other people's opinions. What is great about Morocco is that the landscapes are so varied and contrasting. You can go from the desert to high mountains almost in the blink of an eye. And here, the fauna is completely different. We should see Barbary macaques here, although they're becoming increasingly rare. That is the High Atlas. We are in the Anti Atlas, which is level with the High Atlas. And then you've got the Middle Atlas a bit further north. This is a cedar tree. It's exposed to the wind and the cold, and no doubt often covered in snow. So it is grown in on itself like a bonsai tree. There are centuries of life concentrated in that tiny tree trunk. This is amazing. These herds are off to graze in the high mountain pastures. Why? Because the slopes face south, so the snow melts quicker. When the vegetation starts growing in spring, they'll get a head start. The young shoots won't stand a chance. You've got a long line of sheep following one another like rock climbers, guarded by 80 sheepdogs. That's an 80, a Moroccan breed of mountain sheepdog. Get to work. <laughs>
red-billed choffs are in their element here. This little crow-like bird loves flitting about and is completely at home in the mountains or on cliffs. As for the rock sparrow, it doesn't bat an eyelid as I pass. I've found a small rear deep in the mountains. I've come from the south, so I have crossed the high atlas and I'm now at the junction with the middle atlas mountains where there are meant to be colonies of Barbary macaques, which I'm hoping to see in their natural habitat. Look. This is where the gorges begin. Barbary macaques are the only monkey native to North Africa. Karim and Ali often see them here. So they are leading me to monkey territory. We're starting to see traces. Thank you. Careful, it's slippery. Careful. Do those goats belong to someone, or are they wild goats? They belong to someone, but they roam freely. When they want to catch one, they use a rope. Right. So they're semi-wild. These rock birds must get an amazing view. Is that a wild falcon? Yeah. Is it hunting for prey? Yeah, it's hunting. Not bad. I came here to study the relationship between humans and falcons, you know. Oh, right. We're watching it, but it's seen it's as two. looking in all those snooks and crannies, looking, looking at it, trying to see inside. Behind the rock face. What's that? It's a goat. Look. It must have fallen. Mountains are dangerous places, even for mountain goats. That's what the smell is. The goat's head. It must have been there for a month. It's been cleaned out by vultures. My friends are inside. They went on ahead. Let's see what they found. You okay? So you're in here? Yeah. It's vast. Yeah, it's huge. Wow. It's a rock cathedral. Look at the light. It's amazing. Do you think there might be bats in here? This place must have seen humans, monkeys, birds, and all sorts pass through it. Look at that shaft. That's incredible. He knows his way around. You're more agile than a monkey. Let's head for the rock face. The Barbary macaques must do this all the time, so it must be possible. Watch out, it's slippery. It's not easy being a monkey. I've got a lot to learn. We're going to try and get up close to a colony of Barbary macaques that we spotted up there on the ridge. Look at those massive ones up there. They're huge. We're standing in front of a real colony of Barbary macaques. There are only between 5,000 and 8,000 left in the wild, according to the latest scientific estimations. So this is unbelievable. It's not a good idea to run after a wild animal, because you'll disturb it. We're going to try and position ourselves on the mountain opposite where we can get a closer look. We found a good spot, but it's going to be hard one, because it's quite steep. Up! Watch out, it's slippery. Put this hand in front of you and the other one above it. Where? Above it. I'm trying. It's too slippery. Don't worry, try that other one up there. I can't manage it. Hang on, I'll get there. I've done it. Well done, Remy. I did it. They're on those rocks. There's often a lookout, and when they see humans or any other sort of danger, they warn the group. The idea is to observe them without alarming them. These animals display highly developed social behavior. We can see the male, that big strong one there. 
dominating the group and mating with the female. He's keeping other males at bay. We can see them drinking and delousing one another, which seems to be a way of bonding. So you find Barbary macaques in the middle atlas, in the high atlas, and between the two. If you see one in another country, it's been stolen. I feel so honored to have seen the last remaining Barbary macaques in Morocco, because I fear they'll become extinct one day. We're worried about that too, especially when people start feeding them. So tourists need to be warned not to feed the monkeys. There are signs up everywhere. But people don't pay any attention. They are fast becoming endangered in the wild because the mothers are being killed so that the baby monkeys, less than a year old, can be taken and tamed. This wild landscape is just a few kilometers from the famous 110 meter high Uzud waterfalls. The future of the Barbary macaque will be decided here in the middle atlas since the area has been completely redeveloped for tourism. Shops and restaurants have sprung up all over the place and the monkeys are suffering. They're at the mercy of humans who have turned them into beggars, passing on their diseases. This is the root of the problem. Here we see Barbary macaques similar to those we saw living independently in the wild. But these ones have become dependent on humans because the tourists feed them. There are even stalls selling peanuts. Ali tells me the monkeys have started coughing. They have probably developed an illness caused by close proximity to humans, which is putting the whole community at risk. Look, look, he grabbed that from that man's hand. We can see that this place was once completely wild and preserved, but now the tourists have come flocking to the waterfalls. When we were younger, we saw Barbary macaques everywhere. All living in the wild? There were wild monkeys all over the place. It's enough to make your head spin. Within the space of a day, I've gone from taking in breathtaking scenery to observing the tragic demise of the Barbary macaques. I am now making my descent. After the red-colored mountains of the Middle Atlas, I am heading for the fertile plains of Dukala. I am finally nearing my destination. Soon I will meet Mohammed and his tribe of falconers, the Quassams. Oulad Fredj? It's funny to see herons like this, living communally with humans. They seek out human activity to find food. They are not at all scared of humans. These are cattle egrets, and this is their nuptial plumage. Both males and females grow orange feathers on their heads and chests. I think it's here. It's dead quiet, but I think, yes, I can hear voices. This is amazing. Rémi, salam. Rémi, salam. Mohamed, how do you do? Are you all Kwasems? Yes, you're in the land of the Kwasems. Great. Thank you for having me. And this animal is central to your lives, right? This is a falcon, the bird which unites us. It's a subspecies of the peregrine falcon. Oh, right. You can tell from its talons. Those talons are something else. Amazing. This man is over 90 years old. And that's Abdel Malik. He is hoping to take over. Falconry is passed down from father to son. You, you can't learn falconry theoretically. You have to learn it from another falconer. Come, come see what we've got for you to eat. Wonderful. Squid, tuna, and all sorts. It smells good. Delicious. Have you found that there are fewer fish in the Atlantic than before? Or are you still finding now, enough? No, no. There are fewer? No, the stock is totally depleted. Really? Soon there won't be any fish left. So you are a falconer and a fisherman? 
Yep, I'm a hunter. A hunter of fish and of birds. That's amazing. Do you know much about wildlife? Everything. All wildlife? I know all animals. We're going to get on well then. Of course. <laughs> The difference between traditional methods of hunting and modern methods yes. using guns is that hunters with guns are hunting for themselves, whereas falcons hunt for everyone. If they only catch one bird, we're happy. So this is the end of the hunting season? It's the end of the hunting season. Hunters with falcons practice sustainable hunting. At this time of year, falcons start to molt and their appetites uh, wane. Also. They don't want to go hunting when birds have laid eggs. Oh, I see. So it's sustainable. They respect the cycle of other species. It feels strange to eat, surrounded by animals. The falcons are right here. It can't see a thing. Does the fact that they are in the dark calm them down? It stops them from breaking their feathers, because they just want to hunt and eat. So they might try to fly away. Hoods like these are used all over the world. The tooth and the talons. Amazing. So it's ready. Great. You need to tie a knot to stop the falcon undoing it. They can undo it themselves? Amazing. Yeah, your left hand. There. Okay. It's really light. It feels as if it could just take off. These birds have very light bones and powerful pectoral muscles. And falcons can literally turn their head around 180 degrees and look behind them. So I need to make a nice round fist. OK. This one is for the falcon. The other one is for your phone or a horse. That's why it's always the left fist. So you only have left gloves? Only left gloves. Peregrine falcons are the fastest birds in the world when they swoop. They are known as high flyers. They circle above their prey and then swoop down on it, reaching phenomenal speeds of about 300 kilometers an hour. They attack their prey mid-flight, stun it, knocking it out, and once they're on the ground, they kill it by striking it on the back of the neck. I can tell I'm surrounded by animal lovers. So these are barb horses. That one was born on my land. <laughs> these lambs were born in the night. <laughs> And does everyone have their own falcon? Yes, everyone has a falcon. What do you choose? A male? A female? Only does females. It depend? No males. The males are too small. This is a young falcon, which was caught in the wild. So it is being hacked, which means it's being trained. It's about to be put in contact with its first prey, a pigeon. It's about to be released for the first time by a young falconer. So a young falcon with a young falconer. Young falconers are the future. <laughs> they must learn what to do. OK, and he has this pigeon for training purposes. Yes, he has his pigeon. They're giving the falcon some pigeon heart, so it gets a taste for it. And the pigeon is at the end of the line. Right, it's at the end of the line. Careful, it's about to take off. Okay. Did the falcon rip it apart like that? Wow! It uses its beak as a knife. Now it's really going to get a taste for pigeon meat. It's funny. Everyone is gathered around the falcon while it rips the pigeon apart and eats it. They're celebrating the falcon's first pigeon. Several generations of falconers here. There are some my age, some a bit older, some very old, and then some youngsters. Are you proud to be a member of the Kwasem tribe of falconers? He says he wants to carry on the traditions of his ancestors. He's proud of his falcon. He's learning how to put the hood on. You can see how hard it is to do. There's definitely a knack to it. Come on, over here. How do you do it? 
Like this? Wait for it to calm down. Then you can do it. Didn't you see how he did it? Yes, it's this one, right? Oh, oh we're not going to show you. It's the other one. No, 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 leave it, leave it. You see how hard it is? Is it that one? Very good. Hold it like that. Amazing. Put the hood on. So from the front, like this. Hang on, no. I need to start at the bottom because I need to get it over the beak. Very good. And then I pull this. And the big ones. Now look, they're showing you. Very good. That's it. Thank him. There. Isn't she beautiful? We're going to make partridge soup. Okay. It's already in here. That's yeah. the partridge from earlier. And we're going to add okay. onions, parsley, and garlic. It's hunter's soup. Yeah, falconer's soup. Falconer's soup. So nothing is wasted here. Everything the falcons catch gets eaten. This will add flavor. Great. Oranges from the garden. We don't get these Barbary partridges in France. They look as if they're wearing makeup. Their feathers are so beautiful. They're used for fly fishing. They keep them here and then release them as prey. That adds to the wild population too. Tonight, I have the privilege of sleeping at Mohammed's house, alongside the falcons. I had no idea that the relationship between these birds with their piercing eyes and the humans who tame them was so intense. The secret lies in the act of hunting for prey. Tomorrow, I will go on my first hunt. It's crazy. They're playing folk music to soothe the falcons who sleep here. People don't just keep falcons in their living rooms. They have them in their bedrooms. This is its medicine. Is there special medicine for falcons? What are you doing there? Giving it its medicine. There. Uh, this is glue for gluing the feathers when they break. Ah, so when they break a feather, you repair it. Otherwise, they'd have to wait until they molt. Yeah, which could take up to a year. The wing feathers are the most precious feathers for a falcon. The word falcon comes from falx, which is Latin for scythe, because the wings are shaped like a scythe. You can see that quite clearly. It's impressive. A falcon's wing is like a blade. When you spend time with falcons, they, they gradually learn to recognize your voice. Really? They recognize you? Yeah. When you're out hunting, despite the fact that you're with four or five other hunters, your falcon will recognize you and respond to you. You spend three to four years with the same falcon, so, so it knows you. Falcons are wild birds, not pets. Yeah, they're wild. And you've tamed this one. If you were to set it free, what would happen? It would leave. This falcon would become wild again after one day of being set free. After a day, it would revert to its wild state. If you were to recapture it, you'd have to train it all over again. We're off to see some kestrels' nests. Kestrels are very useful to falconers and help the quassems to capture their falcons. Falcon against falcon? No, they put feathers in the kestrel's talons and then, then release them. The peregrine falcons think the kestrels have caught something, so they go after them. Ah, that's interesting. So you release kestrels with feathers attached to their feet. They fly off, and when the peregrine falcon is released, it sees a falcon with its prey. No, and it catches it. It catches it to steal its prey. Yeah, the feathers are a trap. It's amazing. 
There are animals everywhere. There are wild animals and domestic animals roaming around, sheep, horses and poultry. And there you've got slugi, or Berber greyhounds. Wonderful. So that's a slugi. Yes, it's a Moroccan breed. Slugis have highly developed rib cages. They remind me of cheetahs. It gives them an impressive lung capacity when they're running at top speed. And here they're fed on barley and olive oil. I've never heard of a diet like that for dogs. They have very fine features and big eyes like falcons. They're like the falcon of the dog world because they move so fast and have good eyesight. Look at how fast they're going. Impressive. Impressive. How fast can a slugi run? 60 to 65. 65 kilometers an hour? What's great about you, and this is something we've lost in France, is that you live with your animals. Yeah. When you sit down to eat, the dogs are there. When you sleep, the falcons are there. The animals stay with you. We live surrounded by all sorts of species. Here's the couscous. Oh, great. is it. Time for the fastest animal in the world to go into action. A Quasem's best friend in fighter plane mode. Mohammed tells me that I have to approach it gently because it might think I'm stealing its prey. You're not wearing the same clothes as us, so he thinks you're out to get it. <laughs> it's used to people wearing jalabas, so I have to keep my distance. It's more trusting of the others. The falcon has caught its prey with its talons and killed it, and now it's ripping it apart. Yeah. And now you're going to take the prey away? Right. OK. That's it. See? And now it goes back on the glove. Back on the glove. So it's ready to catch another bird. And meanwhile, you hide the pigeon. Incredible. That's it. It's funny how you can tell what your falcon is thinking just by observing its behavior. You have a real connection with it. Of course. Are there falconers all over the world? We've met falconers from 82 countries, including New Zealand, Africa and France. You see them all carrying their falcons and wearing their traditional clothing. Falconers all speak the same language and train their falcons in the same way. I have contacts in every country. You name a country and I'll put you in touch with a falconer. The most important thing for you is to look after your falcon and teach it to hunt. Right. It doesn't matter so much whether it brings you food. No, that's not important. If I want some meat, I can go to the souk. And how do you see the future of falconry? Because today young people like video games, travelling, sport. It is dying out within our tribe. 
Um, but an association has been set up to train young people uh, to be falconers. Are young people interested? Yeah. Are they coming back to it? I never realized the relationship was so complex, with codes of behavior passed from human to animal, but also from animal to human. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. It's been a pleasure. I'll spread the word about falconry. Thank mm -hmm. you.